Are you thinking of a career in dentistry? Worried about how to get in? Wondering what does a dental education require before you earn that DDS? Our guest today is the Dean of Admissions at a top dental school. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 414th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me today. No matter what graduate program you are applying to, you will need to address the paradoxical challenge that is at the heart of admissions showing that you both fit in at your target schools and stand out in the applicant pool. Except it's free download, fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions will show you how to do both. Master this paradox and you are well on your way to acceptance. You can download this free guide at acceptance.com slash F-I-S-O. Again, that's acceptance.com slash F-I-S-O for fitting in, standing out. Today's guest, Dr. Anita Tora, is Assistant Professor of Clinical Dentistry and Assistant Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs at the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry of USC. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at Tehran Azad University and her DDS from Herman Ostro School of Dentistry of USC, as well as a specialty certificate in prosthodontics. Dr. Tora, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you, Linda. I'm happy to be here. And I'm delighted to speak with you today. Can you give me an overview of the Herman Ostra School of Dentistry of USC's program, focusing on its more distinctive elements? Um, our school is focused in three fundamentals, research, education, and patient care. And these play an integral part of who we are. Um, if, we go, if we go to the research, we've been consistently part of the top funded private dental school by the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. And we have trained many academic leaders who run NIH funded research nationwide and worldwide. Um, we encourage our students to do research, either basic research or translational research. And our faculty guide them to conduct the research and also put together the manuscript for the publication. We host a very successful annual research day, and that's when our student, faculty, and postdoctoral fellows come together to show their innovative discoveries. We also have a publication, The Explorer, who has, which has won multiple national awards that provides a comprehensive summary of all the uh, innovative discoveries that we do at USC. Uh, the second fundamental is patient care. We, um, we are located in the heart of Los Angeles. We have a great and extensive area of patients for our students. And we have very extensive community outreach program that such as Union Rescue Mission, Mobile Clinic, Queens Care, and numerous rotation to the hospitals and communities that gives treatment to our patients. And many of those treatments are for free for our patients. Education, you know, we strive for the best education for our students and we always try to bring new technology, new equipment, new software, new faculty with new ideas. And this commitment shines through in all that we do in field of prosthodontics, endodontics, periodontics, and so on. So at Herman Ostro, we provide the best education for our students. We provide the best treatment for our patient. And we're always in the run to find new innovations through our research program. Great. Now, is is research a, a required part for the students in the in No, it's not no. a required part, but if they're interested, we encourage them and we guide them and support them throughout the process. Okay. And how soon do they start in terms of patient care? Patient care start in the second in a third year. The first two years is mostly like a preclinical where they develop skills and um, 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 procedures. They have to learn the procedures. And then once they complete that program, the, the, the first two years in a preclinical setting, then they go to the clinic and start the patient care. Right. Now, I noticed on your site that uh, Austria students have, and I'm, I'm quoting now from the site, significant preclinical experience, education and training in restorative dentistry using simulators. 
can you disclose the like what kind of simulators that are you know yeah. uh, are they like airplane simulators or driver <laughs> simulators are they are they mannequins what how does that work yeah, so, you know, dentistry is a very unique profession. Uh, just think about it. We're working in a very limited space and it's dark and everything is slippery. And the design of our per patient and everything is in either millimeter or it's in micron. So it could be very challenging to actually do provide dentistry to the patient, you know, mm -hmm. and we strive for the excellence and we um, want the quality, the best quality for our patient. So therefore, we want to mimic this patient in a preclinical setting so that our students learn how to uh, manage the patient, you know. Uh, we have mannequins that they have the face, so there is a limited spacing, they have teeth, and they have a jaw that they cannot open really big, and uh, the chair cannot be upside down, so patients kind of see it straight uh, from the top. So we're kind of stimulating this patient, so during the first year and second year, they're learning the skills with the mannequins. So when they come to the clinic, they're more um, comfortable treating the patient. Um, you know, dentistry is advancing toward digital planning and digital manufacturing mm. called CAD CAM, you know, and we are the forefront in incorporating digital technology in our dentistry, in our program. And we have many different intraoral scanners that our student in year one and two, they get to use and practice and do the restoration and develop the skills. So when they come to third year and fourth year, they use those scanners and those machines and those technology for the, for the patient treatment. Um, they can provide all sorts of restoration from crown, inlay, onlay, implant crowns, complete denture, removable partial denture on the patients. And also we can we use these CAT CAM technology to guide the implant surgeries. And then our students perform the actual surgeries to place the implant on the patients. We have 3D printers that some of the laboratories mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the 3D printers that some of the laboratory steps are printed in-house. So we're trying to expose our student to the best technology out there, the best education that they can get throughout the four years. Wow, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Now, taking the, going a slightly different direction right now, COVID, okay, we're all dealing with it. And it has affected every corner and recess and, and area of our lives. Um, how has COVID affected the Austro Dental School experience and admissions process, specifically dental clinic experience and patient exposure? Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, COVID has affected many lives and we're not alone, you know, <laughs> and we modified our admission process slightly, <clears throat> but still we're looking for the best for our school. Uh, we brought the virtual ward to our interview process, and we conduct the same way that we do um, interviews in the previous year, like in PBL style and a multi-mini interview oh, in really? the Zoom or in a virtual world, yes. Um, in regard to clinic and patient exposure, we have done above and beyond, you know, besides what everybody's doing, social distancing, uh, mask, and, um, you know, uh, and all of that, we are, we have installed numerous HEPA filter machines, these massive machines that are constantly cleaning the air. We are doing weekly COVID testing for all the students and faculty and staff. We, every student who, or faculty or staff that are in, in the patient care, they have been uh, N95 mask fitted. So we're making sure that they're using the proper mask. Um, we COVID test our patients that they come in for any procedure that may cause aerosol droplets. We COVID test them as well. And uh, I'm happy to say we have vaccinated faculty, staff, students. So we try to provide the clean and healthy and productive environment for our faculty, staff, and students and patients. And I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, your students are still getting the clinical exposure that you would have them get. Yes, correct. Yeah, we are open and everything is in motion. Okay, great. Now turning to the application itself, mm -hmm. Ostra was using the AADSAS application. 
Can you review the timeline for applications to OSTRO with the AADSAS application? Because I, I saw online different timelines and I suspect something has changed fairly recently in the last couple of years. Okay. Yes, so um, the application cycle usually opens in June and then it closes February 1st. Um, so, but the students have, the applicants have the option of kind of pre getting some preparation ready, like personal statement, you have that ready. You don't need to wait the, the application cycle opens right. or you can talk to the people that you want to ask for a letter of recommendation, have those ready. But so when the June comes, when the application cycle opens, they can submit it. So once they submit the application, the assets uh, will verify, make sure the transcript and grades are accurate and so forth. And then they let us know. At that point, we start reading the application and deciding to invite for an interview. Okay, and, and interview invitations would then go out in the in the fall and, and early winter, typically. No, we start interview late August, September, okay. and it's a role mission. And then we just continue when we think that um, we we try to interview as many as we can because we want to give this opportunity to many applicants as possible, so we can select yeah, handpick every single one that we want them to come here. Okay, and um, in terms of what what kind of dental clinical exposure do you like to see in your applicants? Um, can you give a guideline? Um, you know, of it? yeah, um, you know, dental school is a big commitment. It's financially, time-wise, and physically, you know, it's really hard on your neck and your back and so forth. So we want to make sure that the applicants, they know what they're getting into. This is their passion. This is what they want for the rest of their life, you know? So it's it's nice that they go to other offices, they shadow the dentist, they talk to the dentist, they ask them, okay, why, what do you like dentistry? What is it that you don't like in dentistry? And reflect and this see if this is truly what you wanna do for the rest of your life, you know? Um, it's sad sometimes you hear that students, they, they did they second in the first semester or second semester or whatever, they think that dentistry is not their passion and then they change career or whatnot. It's a big loss in time and money for them. And it's a big loss for someone who could have come and flourish at dental school and become a fantastic clinician, you know? So we wanna make sure that they know what they're getting into. I think that's so important. Um, certainly something that we advise our clients and using almost the exact same language that, that you use. It's just important for them to know before they make the commitment, financial and in terms of time, exactly. that they have some some idea of That's what they're getting into. And it can't just be because their aunt told them they should become a dentist or there's family pressure, or they think it's a good way to make a living, you know, lifestyle. That, that can be a factor, especially the lifestyle, not so much the aunt, but it shouldn't be the whole reason. Exactly, you're absolutely correct, yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now. What about, I mean, Ostro does a lot in terms of community service. You mentioned the union mission. Do you also like to see non-clinical or non-dental community service in your applicants? Is that important? Um, you know, at Herman Ostro, we train our students to be a healthcare provider. You know, we want them to be a great clinician, right. best scholar and best healthcare provider for their community. You know, we want them to be compassionate and considerate and kind-hearted, someone who go above and beyond for their patient, you know? So it's very heartwarming to read an application that the applicant has done some community services that shows compassion. And we love to see that, you know? Like I said, we have a very extensive community outreach program that our students go through rotations through these underserved communities and provide this care for, uh, for our patients. And this way, this is the lesson that we give them that um, be compassionate, reach out to those in need, you know? Um, and uh, we do exit interview our students, like after graduation, we interview them. It's like, tell us what you wanna tell us, you know? And oftentimes this is one of the thing that they mentioned that this outreach program has contributed greatly, not only that to their professional growth, but impacted them as human beings. So, it's great. We provide this fantastic opportunities for them, for students, for our patient. And we would like to 
uh, have an applicant that who is a lot in a line with us in that regard. That's a great answer. Thank you. Now you mentioned that at Austro students still interview that you have an individual interview and that you have the multi mini interview. Um, what is the interview? Can you go and tell us a little bit more about the interview day? at mm -hmm. Ostro in, in the time of COVID now, yeah. um, is it a day or is it an interview? And do you, what do you intend for the next cycle since that's around the corner? The COVID era was an interview day. Yeah. But, um, because of the COVID, since we could not invite them, uh, so we cannot do an interview day, it will be an interview kind of week. Uh, so we kind of break it down into little pieces. Um, and still we want to kind of um, get to know them and we want them to get to know us, you know, after all, they have to choose us too. Mm -hmm. So usually um, in a day, I give a presentation, an hour presentation. And like you mentioned, I have a very unique position because I was a dental student. I was a resident. I'm a faculty. I, I was a course director, mm -hmm. teaching course, and I was a group practice director, kind of mentoring juniors and seniors. So I know every question that applicants ask. So during that hour presentation, I'll tell them who we are at USC and uh, what we do and answer all the questions that they have. And then we do, and another time we do MMI interviews uh, virtually. And also we do PBL interviews over the Zoom. And uh, we wanna kind of evaluate their maturity and their reasoning, are they professional? Are they a team player? Can they communicate? You know, all of that. So we pick that up from the, uh, during the interview. And then we have a fantastic school. So we, we want to show off our school. So sure. we have like a virtual tour that applicants can go. Uh, we have sessions that they can talk to the ambassadors to see how is the life of a dental student at Herman Ostro, you know? And also we have another um, introduce our uh, student club and organization. We have numerous uh, student clubs and we wanna introduce it to them so they feel more included and, um, uh, and engaged. Okay, great, thank you. And if, if we get to a time, hopefully not in the too distant future when travel becomes normal again, do you see the interviews be going back to being in person or staying virtual or have you given that any thought? Well, you know what? I don't know what the COVID virus is gonna tell me to do next day. I mean, right. or next month, I don't know. But if we go to back to normal, which I hope will be soon, uh, I mean, it's really nice to see them in, per in person, you know, you get the eye contact and body language. These are the things that um, it's very cold when you walk to someone in the camera, you know. Yeah. Um, so I would love to go back to in-person interview because it's just more welcoming and more um, um, more sweet to the applicant and they can get to see the school and they can get to see the student in action in a sim lab or in a clinic but we'll see what virus tells us and we'll do whatever the virus does right right um now there was a great video on the on the website and it said that also typically receives roughly 3,000 applications and matriculates 144 students. That wasn't all that the video said. It's a little scary. There was a lot of other information in it. But what review process does an application typically, typically go through to get from 3,000 to 144? And how on earth do you win it, winnow it down? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a great pool of applicants. We have so many highly qualified applicants. And I wish we could admit them all, but we can't, unfortunately. But the review process is a holistic review. We look at this applicant as a whole, you know, both cognitively and non-cognitively. What is the course load? How many classes they're taking? How are they performing in those classes? Are they working outside? Are they doing any other activities and so forth while during the school? So we just wanna see what kind of applicant we have, you know, because dental school program it's a very bigger curriculum. So we want to make sure that the students that are coming to dental school, they can handle the program. 
you know, this is very different from undergrad when you have a class Monday morning and Tuesday afternoon and Thursday morning, you know. Um, the students are busy every day, either with classes and seminar, uh, PBL cases, rotation and patient care. So they, they have to run a few things all at the same time. And when they start treating the patient, they have to think ahead of the game. What does my patient need in two appointments from now so I can have it ready today? So they have to learn to multitask, you know? And that requires a discipline, that requires a dedication and motivation and hard work. And these are the elements that we wanna take from the application through their activities, the letter of recommendation, personal essay, grades, scores, you know, all of that. Is there anything that you look for in applicants today? Let's say after, you know, one year into, I shouldn't say after yet, one year into the, the pandemic that maybe you didn't look for before the pandemic or two, five, 10 years ago? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm glad that you asked because um, as I mentioned in the previous question, we look for the best clinician. We look for the best scholar and best educator for the, uh, and the best human being overall, you know? And uh, so that's why we look at, we want to look at each applicant in a comprehensive manner. So great and academic uh, work helps, but also their character, their mindset. How do they uh, approach to a problem? Are they resilient? You know, their maturity, they all plays an important role in our decision making too. That's why for the past three years, we have impl implemented um, multi mini interview to assess these immeasurable qualities like empathy, professionalism, maturity, ability to work in a team and communication and so on. How many stations are in your MMI? Um, virtually, we had nine stations. So wow. we <laughs> it is, yes, impressive, very impressive. That is a lot. It is, yes. Um, wow. Okay. How do you view, I mean, one of the questions I, you know, I think drives applicants a little bit nuts is they apply mm -hmm. and then they hear nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then if they're lucky, they get an interview invitation yeah. and everything is nice and wonderful and they hear nothing. Yeah. How do you view in letters of intent or update letters or, you know, either from waitlisted applicants or from applicants before they're waitlisted, maybe after they're interviewed or even before they're interviewed? Mm -hmm. I know it's a stressful process. Trust me, I've been in that boat myself. So yeah. process and uh, and like I said, we have many highly qualified applicants that unfortunately we cannot admit them all. So we have to kind of select, but we have an open door policy. You know, if the applicants have questions, please email us. We can go over the Zoom. We can make a phone call, go over your application. We help them and however that we can. Sometimes we go over the application and we say, okay, maybe you want to improve in this area or you want to do this, kind of guide them to, to the right direction. Um, so we interview from September going on and then it's a rolling admission. However, the first letter of acceptance cannot go out. Um, this year was, uh, this cycle was December 15. Um, but previous year it was December 1st. But after that, then we send the acceptance like throughout the, the cycle. Um, and uh, yes, it is a stressful process, but we try to communicate with our students. As soon as we hear something, we communicate with them and they're in the direct communication with us. So we're here to help them. But unfortunately, as far as, far as being a stressful process, I don't think there is a way to make it less stressful. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is a stressful process, but are you are you open to updates from them? I mean, let's say they get a 4.0 in the you know the last semester of their senior year or the fall semester of their senior year. Would you want them to send you a, an email updating, not you personally, but the Austro School? Awesome. You know about that. Update us um, if the, you completed the summer course or the spring semester. Uh, you have a new transcript, let us know, we update it. If they, they do more hours, if they have been working and then doing community outreach, let us know, we add it to their application. Open door is like wide open door policy. Okay. So it's, and it's two way. Yes. Um, great. 
On, on a forward looking note, what advice would you give to dental school applicants thinking ahead and planning to apply this summer for 2022 matriculation, or perhaps even planning to apply later for a later matriculation? Yes. Um, my advice to them is think long and hard. Is this truly your uh, passion, you know? Do you see yourself doing this every day, all day? Um, do you love it? Or like we talked about it earlier, is this something that you're doing it because you were said so? Get involved to this dental clinic, talk to the dentist, talk to many dentists, ask questions, you know? Make sure that this is what you really want to do. Once you confirm that your heart is in the right place, then work hard, study good. Prove to the admission committee that you are capable of the course load of dental school. You know, you are hardworking, you are dedicated, you are motivated and committed. Study hard, hard and get good grades. Also, so it sounds like the heart should proceed ahead. Yes, absolutely. And also prove to the committee members that you will be a great doctor for your community, you know, you, that you're compassionate and caring and you're putting others before you. And you do that with the community services that are out there. Just go there and get involved and prove it to us that you are capable of the course load of the school and you're going to be the best clinician, the best educator and the best scholars that we want us, our students to be. Wonderful answer. Thank you. Is there anything you would have liked me to ask you? Um, no, I think this advice is, is the great question. I'm glad you asked because I, I really, we, we are here to help our students and we want them to have a great profession, be fulfilled with what they do. Their patients is happy with them and it's a two-way street, you know. We want to have um, great uh, alumni network. We have a very strong alumni network and we want them to be always available for their community and their colleagues. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Tora. I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you really for joining me and sharing your expertise and your insight. I know you have a few things to take care of. This has been just delightful. Glad to be here. You're welcome. We'll include links in the show notes at accepted.com slash 414 to Ostro's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. One of those resources is Fitting In and Standing Out, which I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. Master the Paradox at the Heart of Graduate Admissions by downloading our free guide, Fitting In and Standing Out, the Paradox at the Heart of Admissions. You can get your copy at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. Again, grab your copy at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. I also want to invite you to participate in the Thank You for Your Review contest. One listener a month who leaves a podcast review on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes, will win a free 20-minute consultation with me. You can leave your review at lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. Again, that's all one word, lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. I look forward to hearing from you and speaking with you. This is Admissions Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 